Okay, welcome. Let's get started. You are joining the webinar for the 2021 Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council Conference. Welcome. This is our kickoff, our first webinar. We'll be talking about lessons learned from 2020 and how to be prepared for this wildfire fire season. Before we get started, I just want to run through a couple of slides. The Wildfire uh, Council is organized by a, it's a group effort. So State Forest Service, Sustainability Council, Route County, Route County, Colorado Mountain College, CSU Extension, Steamboat Ski Area, and the Steamboat Board of Realtors. We are thankful to our title sponsor, Steamboat Board of Realtors, and the Colorado Association of Realtors. I quickly want to go over some webinar, um, just what to do. One, realize that this webinar is being recorded and it will be um, posted on our website, routewildfire.org, um, a few days after, after the recording. This is a webinar format. So you will realize as an attendee that you are muted and you won't see your photo. Um, you do have an opportunity to ask questions by writing them in the Q&A that's down at the bottom. Um, we don't have a chat feature. Um, you also obviously will be muted. If you are calling in, you can raise your hand. Um, that's star nine. And if you, um, we will call on you or, and then you can speak with star six. Um, so that's, that's how we have the questions. Um, we will be starting out, this is a moderated conversation, so we'll be starting out with the discussion and then we'll, we'll hold the Q&A until the end. And here we have our speakers for tonight. And we are excited, we, this is a great panel um, with some experts and stakeholders um, who will really be able to tell us about last year, 2020, and then help us to, to think about what this year might look like. I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop my screen share and move us over to get this started. Let me just end this. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thanks so much. Let me just, sorry about that. Okay, as I said, this is the kickoff meeting and we're really excited to have everyone. I wanna quickly, uh, we saw the pictures, but I quickly wanna introduce everyone and, and if you could panelists wave for me as I call out your name. So first we have Dan Gibbs. He's the Colorado Department of Natural Resources Executive Director. Kevin Thompson is the US Forest Service South Zone Fire Management Officer for the Medbo Route National Forest. Mo DeMora, he's a Route County Emergency Manager, Management, Emerging Management Director. Brad White, Grand Fire Protection District One Fire Chief. John Twitchell, who is the Colorado State Forest Service Supervisory Forest in the Northwest area. And Julie Baxter, City of Steamboat Springs Senior Planner and the Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council board member. So we're gonna start this conversation with you, Brad. We're gonna start looking backwards to 2020 wildfire season and focus on the East Troublesome Fire. Brad, can you provide us some context to the extent of the East Troublesome Fire? Um, give us some of those overall metrics. Yeah, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways we're we're still kind of assessing a lot of that. But um, you know, 2020 obviously was a big fire year, um, and we had you know here in Grand County, just like you guys in Route County, had uh, fire kind of all around us. And um, you know, season really got going in earnest in July, and uh, certainly we had some big fires start in August. So East Troublesome was a little unique in that it didn't actually start uh, until October 14th. And it was actually a relatively short fire. I mean, I think as far as the Grand County portion, we had uh, from ignition to, you know, having it under, you know, a foot of snow was about 10, 11 days, something like that. And then, and of course, it jumped over into Larimer County and they, they spent another couple of days over there. But, um, you know, it, it went 3,400 3, acres that first day, uh, October 14th, uh, near the town of Kremlin, kind of northeast of Kremlin. 
And, you know, for the next week, it grew between five and 4,000 acres a day. Some days a little more, some a little less, just depending on weather conditions and all that. Um, but uh, Wednesday night uh, of October the 21st, um, we experienced a, a blow up and we went from, you know, I think it was about uh, 18,000 acres to about 126,000 acres in, in just a few, a few hours that afternoon and that evening. Um, so over 100,000, 106,000 acres, I think, on the 20, afternoon of the 21st. So, um, you know, just huge explosive growth. And um, finished out, the fire finished out, I think, um, you know, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, we ended up about 194,000 acres um, over the next little bit there. And, and finished out as, you know, the state's second largest wildland fire. And, and what I'm being told, you know, our emergency operations group is our emergency management and those guys are still, uh, we're still working some assessments and stuff. I, I've heard the structure number come up a little bit, some more, you know, outbuildings and things, but basically 366 homes, like 566 structures. And I, I'm being told it's the, you know, probably the most destructive fire dollar wise uh, in, in state history. And I know, I know our fire district alone, we lost about $150 million in, in valuation and property in 2018 dollars. So, so pretty, pretty good sized fire. Yeah. Um, Grant has been pretty forward thinking on mitigation work. Um, what components of that work made a difference during the fire? Well, I think the lesson, you know, we're looking at is, is everything counts, right? Um, this fire was, you know, during that big explosive growth period, um, we certainly had a, a fire front, you know, a, a section of, of ground where really not much was going to survive. Um, but as you, as you work off of that, you know, we get into, I, you know, I, I almost look at that as kind of the nuclear zone where just nothing much survived. But you get off on the shoulders there into kind of the war zone where we had a lot of suppression efforts going for, you know, days and days and days. And uh, we, we actually have some good data on who's done work and who's taken advantage of our wildfire council cost share programs and our chipping days and things like that. So right now, as the snow's coming off, we're, we're trying to get in and, and assess, you know, what was savable, what was protectable versus what made it and what didn't. But, but we know working with all the fire crews in there that, um, you know, the, the homeowners in that, I say that area, but it's a large, large area, but uh, many, many homes were saved that had done some mitigation work and done some lemming and, and some basic cleanup and stuff. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I just would leave it, I guess, that mitigation was effective where fire conditions allowed it to be effective. Right, that makes sense. And lessons learned, what would you do differently with future mitigation? Well, I, I think the big thing for us is, is, you know, we had an afternoon where our definition of wooey has changed a lot. And, um, you know, whereas we always felt like, you know, if you're, you're a mile and a half from a heavily treed area, you're probably in the clear. We certainly had some areas up you know, for instance, Trail Creek and up by the National Park that were well out in the river bottom or ag land and, and hardly a tree around that, um, you know, still a lot of loss of homes and stuff. So we're really kind of, you know, again, everything counts and, and we are still working with our HOAs and our, our property owners on doing everything they can to mitigate those land, their, their own land, their own property, do the limbing and stuff. And, and we've always tried to work well with our Fed partners and know what, you know, big, big projects are up and coming and, and try to get some input in. You know, I think the big thing for us now is, is recognizing that this isn't going to be every fire. This is the top one or two percent. You know, all that's still effective for all these other fires we've seen. But we're just, you know, for us, we're just trying to really look at what does it take to have a, you know, a coordinated community-wide protective measure. So that, that means working with our Fed partners, we're working with state, working with um, large property owners, as well as the individual parcel owners, you know, the single family homes and things like that. And, and just try to come up with, you know, fuels projects and mitigation projects working together. And I'm gonna, I know this, everybody's gonna be talking about wooey and you're my first person to bring it up. Oh. So would you define that for everybody? Cause I know there might be people on this thing who do not. Yeah, know. well, the, the wooey is the, the wildland urban interface and you're hearing intermix these days too. So it, it's just where, you know, the homes and, and the improvements meet the, meet the, not just the forest, but in our case, sage and, you know, meet the vegetation basically. Yeah. Okay, and the other one I want you to find because we're going to be talking about a lot is fuel reduction. Just 
So these are, you know, we have such a mix of people on this call that um, maybe they aren't familiar with that term as well. Yeah, and, and there may be somebody more qualified on this to, to talk about it a little bit. But, you know, for us, fuel reduction, you know, it's anywhere from the big fuels projects where we're just really trying to, to, to create a fuel break between, you know, the homes and the not the homes. And uh, but even fuel reduction on a, on a around an individual home, you know, just picking up the sticks and limbing the trees and and creating a, an area where we can stop fire. Great. Thanks so much, Brad. You bet. Great. The East Troublesome Fire, as Brad talked about, covered 190,000 acres, many of which were on national forest land. Our next panelist was involved with the suppression efforts for the East Troublesome and also closer to home with the Middle Fork Fire. Approximately 47%, 11 million acres of Colorado's forests are managed by USFS, making them a key stakeholder in finding the needed solutions for wildfire mitigation and suppression, both regionally and here in Route County. 2021 is forecasted to be a very busy fire season. Summit, Rio Blanco, and Route have already had wildfires so far. So now I'd like to introduce Kevin and ask you, Kevin, can you give us a regional overview of the 2020 fire season for the US Forest Service in the Northwest area of Colorado and address some of the environmental variables that got us there and where we are now? Yeah, thanks, Sarah, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to focus kind of on the Craig dispatch area. Um, as we know, there was a lot, Brad mentioned, there was a lot of, lot of fire activity last year, but the Craig dispatch area covers Moffat, Rio Blanco, Route, Grand, Jackson, and parts of Summit, Eagle, and Garfield counties. Overall, uh, below average number of fire ignitions but with that well above average acres burned for the dispatch area. And in, in your handouts that you got, you should, there should be a handout that shows, shows those statistics. Uh, fire season started with a couple of fires before green up in Rio Blanco and Route counties. Once we got green up, we had smaller fire, fires up until about July. And then in July, Rio Blanco and Moffat County saw an uptake in ignitions and also large fires. Uh, what was driving these was low, low fuel moistures in the sagebrush, high temperatures, and low relative humidity with little to no precipitation where, <clears throat> where the values or <clears throat> variables that were driving these fires. August, uh, as for, August came around and we had little ignitions for the Craig dispatch area, but Grand Junction dispatch area and Fort Collins dispatch areas right next to us. Right. The, the, this was their kind of prime time. This is when Pine Gulch, we could see the smoke coming from that. We could see Grizzly Creek, Williams Fork was starting, Cameron Peak had started and what, and they were all kind of making their large runs, but we, we were kind of sitting, sitting pretty good, but we were seeing at that time our low, we we're starting to see really low dead and live fuel moistures for the mountains in our high country. And we were still seeing those high temps, low relative humidity, and really little to no precipitation. We were supposed to get them monsoons and we really got a week of it and it was really scattered throughout. It wasn't the, really the consistent large coverage monsoons that you, we do get in the mountains. Um, by the end of August, the Zirkle fire happened in Route County up in the Zirkle Wilderness. This was kind of the first for us uh, in the dispatch area. It was a high elevation fire, really close to tree line. And it went 11 acres. And that was the first time we'd seen something in the higher elevations really start to move and really, really was kind of a precursor to what was coming. And then in September, we, we got the Middle Fork fire and the Mullen fire started. And both of those showed right off the bat, showed extreme fire behavior. And these were driven by low fuel moisture, high winds, high temperatures, and low relative humidity. And then this trend, it, we, we just didn't get, usually we get some snow. We got some areas that got snow, some that didn't in that early September, uh, late September push. And then the, the trend just kind of carried over into October. And that's where we saw that East Troublesome fire. And where that ignited, that area didn't really get the moisture that even like Middle Fork did or Mullen did in some of those late, late September, early October um, uh, storms that we got. And then as Brad said, Brad went through and gave a good description on the East Troublesome. And then on uh, October 24th, we got a, a 
big, it did pretty much snow everywhere. And that was pretty much the season ending event that, that we needed and, and we got until 2021. Great, thank you. Can you speak to your own fuel reduction work and how the US Forest Service is making our forests more resilient to future wildfires? Yeah, so since 2000, I did some number crunching and since 2008 on the route side of the Medicine Bow route, we've done over 35,000 acres of treaty of treatment, fuel reduction. Of those 35,000 acres, we've done 4,284 acres we're completed in the wildland urban interface, or now I can say wooey. <laughs> um, another project that we had done that kind of stand, stands out, we just completed, we've done a lot of NEPA uh, and uh, completed burn plans for a project we were calling the Middle Fork of the East Troublesome, which was really near where the East, East Troublesome started. And we were planning on doing uh, some burning and some stuff up in that area um this this coming spring and well that, that kind of got completed for us so that one that one didn't happen and then uh currently locally we we have projects that are like uh steamboat front where we've completed already 1100 acres with uh help from colorado state forestry through an agreement program we have with them but we're looking at doing some more prescribed burning off of that trying to get more up Words around another thousand acres through prescribed burning. Um, we have the Morrison Creek project out by Stagecoach, which is a fuels reduction along uh, boundary lines. And then we have one over in um, the Old Park subdivision, which is just was affected by the Silver Creek fire in 2018. And we're looking to kind of build off that and protect some of the homes in there some more. And then we're also planning for some more movie projects in the North Route area and in Jackson County. And then we're going to continue to do timber sales to remove the beetle kill trees in areas where the material is still able to sell and it's feasible to do so. And one of the bigger areas in Route County that we'll probably have going on this summer that people will see will be uh, kind of in the big red, red park area. Um, another interesting concept that we're, we're working on is called pods and that's potential operational delineations. And this, this process, uh, it started kind of out in Arizona and California, and it's really kind of caught on in the last few years, and it's kind of, we're seeing a national push for this. This process helps identify values, suppression difficulty, along with a few other things, and helps identify potential areas where you can have higher success at managing fire. Uh, pods can also help identify where future fuel projects may be needed to help with management of fire. Interesting. Um, thanks. Are you seeing changes in strategies and or policies at the federal level that you think will impact us locally? Um, for sure. Uh, in the handout, we gave you the, uh, the 2021 national fire themes for all the federal aid agencies. Um, that, that helps. It gives a unified direction. And then the other thing that we're really seeing, and I, you know, not only in federal agencies, but everybody we're really starting to acknowledge the extreme fire behavior that we're seeing nationwide. And that is, you know, really we're seeing now this last year in the dispatch area and even route County, you know, seasons are lengthening, um, suppression costs, increase in aerial resources, you know, and just having, in order to do this, working across all the agencies and, you know, not, no, not one person knows the solutions. Mm -hmm. And so I see a, we're really meeting a lot more and, and working with some of that stuff. Uh, locally, within Colorado, one of the probably biggest updates we had is we updated our master operating plan, which allows the federal agencies to pick up the cost of aircraft on initial attack for the first 48 hours. Uh, prior to it, uh, the past years, it, it's been um, the local and the state's responsibility to cost cover some of that aircraft, and sometimes that can get get uh, tricky. And now we know if there's aircraft in there, we can just send them. We don't we're, we have all that kind of figured out ahead of time, and that we can utilize that. And I, I think that's going to be a really big uh, thing going forward. And then the other thing, regional regional will have six additional Type One helicopters, which are the the big helicopters that can carry up to 2,400 gallons at a time. 
which are highly effective in this area. And then um, we all kind of came together and we created a, the Craig Dispatch Fire Danger Operating Plan. And that, that has identified responses to wildfires under certain conditions. Um, all of the federal agencies, along with the counties and the state, signed the plan and worked on the plan. And previously, we, the, some of the federal agencies had their own plan, but they were all a little different. And now we're all kind of working under one, one plan. And that, that will be a big thing. And then to end it here, the, the last thing that we kind of will continue to do is we're still going to continue to have the COVID-19 guidelines. And we're going to continue with that just to help protect our firefighters and then also help protect the public as we bring people in and out supporting these fires and also supporting uh, the projects and everything else that we have going on. Yeah, that's huge. Um, so you talked a little about the agreement with the Colorado State Forest Service, the Good Neighbor Authority or agreement. So that's the US Forest Service working together with the State Forest Service. Um, and using that, you were able to do fuels mitigation work at Mad Creek um, a few years ago. How did this work support the suppression efforts for the Mill Fork Fire? Yeah, the, it, it did it in a lot of ways. And I think the number one way that, you know, we have really good coordination with Route County right now with Mo, who's going to be talking after me and everything. We have good relationships with them. But this, this really helped because we'd already met with some homeowners in the area, some people prior to go over some of the, you know, what are the values, what's out there. So we had some, pre, uh, some already coordination. So once we went to it, it made really easy. We knew FireWise with Colorado State Forestry that, you know, we could get a hold of them and we could get some information out there. Uh, with, with that project too, we up uh, a service road, an administrative road that goes back to the bridge. Um, a lot of people use it for a hiking trail and stuff now. We were able to fix some things in that road to get equipment back, which that also made it easier to get supplies to, for the historic Mad Creek Barn mm -hmm. if we needed to do protection and also for people to do assessments and stuff. And then also allowed the firefighters, once they saw the road and stuff, they saw that it was a good road. And so they were comfortable driving down there with reduced the lengths of hikes into Swamp Park and some other areas. Um, and then overall, I mean, the, the really big thing with it, when you, you spend that much time working on a project in there, you're just way more familiar with that area. Uh, you you kind of have a, going into it, you have a really good sense of where where you might be able to hold some stuff and or put some things and have have high probability of success. And with that, the the stuff that the areas that we had treated through mastication, and everything, we felt really, really comfortable that those areas we would have a really high probability of success with aerial resources and ground resources if the fire did come into those areas, that we would be able to make to make a stand really well there. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And now Mo, we're gonna turn over to you. As we've heard the Middle Fork fire get really close to home. The Route County Office of Emergency Management is working to prepare our communities in the face of emergencies just like that. The OEM is also responsible for identifying and tracking hazards and potential disasters in Route County. So it's no surprise that the All Hazards Mitigation Plan it was just finalized last year, identified wildfires as the greatest threat to our county. Mo, can you describe the county's response to the Middle Fork fire? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we continue to be fortunate in that we have uh, outstanding partners with our federal agencies, uh, like Kevin mentioned, the US Forest Service, as well as Bureau of Land Management. Uh, as well as with our state resources, uh, with the Division of Fire Prevention and Control. And in the time I have been here, we've, we have never had a fire that had a, even a potential of getting rid of large uh, without having representatives to meet to those partner agencies on, on scene with resources and, and help us in, uh, suppress that fire. So, um, I, so I speak for Route County, but I know all the other counties as well, um, really value that partnership. Uh, but for Middle Fork Fire, I think we were even more financially, at least from a financial perspective, um, or, or we were advantaged because of financial perspective, because the fire remained on Forest Service property. Um, 
So it does not mean that we didn't provide anything, um, but we also have to worry about at the county level, our, our wildfire fighters are also the structural firefighters who are also the emergency medical technicians. So we always have to be prepared for those other emergencies that will be ongoing. So uh, we do provide uh, per agreement, a minimal amount of resources uh, per the agreement, but we try to provide as much as we can. So initially for the Middle Fork fire, uh, we provided, um, well, with our local partners at the fire districts, we provided the fire station for them to uh, have an incident command post. Um, and then we moved that down to the county shop. And we also deployed our mobile communications van, uh, which provided uh, satellite capability and communications, uh, so better connectivity uh, to communicate with the teams in the field, as well as access various uh, web-based programs and management programs and whatnot. So uh, we provided uh, the incident command post, the communications van, and then we had a storage facility that we borrowed from our search and rescue team. Uh, is there a storage barn? So we were able to uh, stage some elements of the incident management team in there, uh, as well as we moved the trail out there, provide some additional storage. Uh, as far as actual suppression assets, um, most of the what we did, uh, we had our road and bridge department uh, provided a dozer and crew. Uh, they were able to, uh, they weren't so much cutting fire line, but they were uh, improving the access roads uh, to make sure that the uh, suppression crews had a means to uh, get to where the fire was uh, safely and effectively, uh, especially if the fire continued to grow in the most dangerous directions towards the values at risk. Um, then we have access roads that make sure we get the resources uh, to where they need to be. Um, we did have elements of um, most of fire departments at some point when we were concerned about uh, the potential to impact some of the residences, uh, doing a lot of door-to-door, -door, uh, visiting with the residents that uh, were potentially going to be threatened um, and informing them of some immediate actions they can take on their properties to make it more resilient, uh, as well as just advise them of the uh, potential of of an evacuation and what that would look like and things that they should think about. So we were doing that uh, up north um, around Clark and, and surrounding areas and also down uh, around the Strawberry uh, Park area and uh, with all those residences. So uh, we did not have a lot of uh, crews actually doing suppression for this fire, but they were doing a lot of the outreach uh, and they provided some of those other resources like heavy equipment um, and then the incident command posts and communications. Great. What, what are the county's responsibilities for mitigation and suppression within the, the WUI and for all our community's assets? Well, you know, that's a, a very interesting question. And, and unfortunately, it's not one that I can give a, um, uh, a maybe a, a complete success story type of answer. I would say for the most part, the county, as far as mitigation, uh, we focused on education. You know, what can people do? What should people do? Uh, to make their profits more resilient. Um, and, and I know there's been some successes there, but uh, maybe uh, tough to actually quantify or, or identify clearly. Uh, but I think as part of this, when, like you mentioned earlier, as we um, complete our hazard mitigation plan, and of course, wildfires is one of our, probably the top priority uh, when you look at likelihood of occurrence and uh, the damage that can occur. So that is something we're uh, looking at uh, focusing on. And, and, and I think part of that, um, you know, the result of that is, is this, is this co council itself. We recognize that this is important to help identify uh, what those projects are, what they could be, and not just what they are, what they could be, but you know, how we're going to pay for them and finance them and manage them. So I think this body uh, will definitely help us get moving in the direction, um, putting more focus on mitigation and suppression. I mean, suppression is always going to be required. Um, but with a better mitigation program, we think we'll be able to reduce that um, to suppression cost. Um, one other thing that we are doing, uh, which was identified in the hazard mitigation plan, is that we will be updating, uh, we plan on updating our community wildfire protection plan or CWPP. And that CWPP should help us identify those highest hazard areas. Um, you know, so what are some projects that are feasible 
as well as maintainable or attainable that we can do uh, to, with what limited resources we have uh, where we can get the biggest bang for the buck. So we did apply for a FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure to Communities Grant. And uh, we, it, it's a pass-through grant, meaning we applied through the state. We achieved uh, a very good score at the state. So now it goes up to FEMA and they were expecting to hear in June or July uh, FEMA's decision on those grants. Uh, so we're remaining optimistic that we will be awarded uh, some grant money uh, so that we can then update our community wildfire protection plan. Great, great. Um, I know that you are super passionate about this. So I want to ask, um, what is one thing you would like to communicate about wildfire preparedness and emergencies? Well, there are a lot of things we're doing. Like I said, we've we've uh, we've been focusing more on uh, education, uh, so that property owners uh, have have access to and are aware of information out there and what they could do and what they should do to make their properties more resilient. But from emergency management perspective, uh, my, my, um, me, I look at my primary mission being to notify the public of an emergency situation and what action they need to take immediately to ensure their own survival. And our, so my biggest priority is to be able to do that. And the best way I can do that is through our, um, what is often referred to as reverse 911, but our public alert system is the routecountyalerts.com. One word, routecountyalerts.com. So we ask people to register because um, that helps us be able to get hold of people and tell them that they need to take some mac immediate action to ensure their safety. Uh, as an example, when we had the Deep Creek fire, there was a community that was going to be uh, potentially threatened. The fire crossed a certain line that we established, so we wanted to put a community on a pre-evac notice. So as soon as that fire crossed that line, it, the incident commander let me know. Within 20 minutes, we sent out a notice to all the houses in that community that they should start begin preparations for evacuation. So that notice went out within about 20 minutes. Um, but we also get data back that tells us that out of those, oh, those 24 homes, only two of them were registered. So we go and know that two of them, we've got the information. So then we had to, which we would have anyway, but then we sent sheriff deputies up there uh, to go door to door. And, and that process took over two hours. So there was two hours of time that those homeowners, uh, if they were registered and would have got the notification uh, from our system, would have had time to collect valuables and make arrangements and all that. So it is of critical importance that uh, people register at Route County Alerts. And it's not just for wildfires. We've used them for things such as sending out boil water notices when there is a problem with the uh, system and, and the public shouldn't be drinking the water without boiling it. We've used it for shelter in place when we've had a hazardous material uh, truck uh, or ca truck carrying hazardous material roll over in rabbit ears and we had to have um, uh, a neighborhood evacuated because we weren't sure what the chemical was it immediately. So there are numerous cases where we may have to notify the public to do something, whether it be evacuate uh, or shelter in place. And the most efficient way we have is Route County Alerts. Um, one more thing on Route County Alerts, which I like to advertise, is that we can indicate, we ask regist registrants to let us know if they have an access or functional need that may require a certain uh, level of support. So as you get through the registration process, uh, there is a page that asks you to identify, self-identify if you have any needs, such as if you have a mobility impairment or your wheel uh, wheelchair bound or you're dependent on oxygen equipment or um, you don't have transportation, can't drive and all that kind of stuff. Because now if we do a alert, um, we can query the residences that received it and then we can look in there and say if there's anyone in that community that indicated that they need they don't have transportation. That gives us a heads up that we need to send some vehicle up there or maybe even a, a wheelchair accessible vehicle to help get those people out. But if we don't know about it, then we're gonna be late in getting uh, the resources up there. So not only is it a, is routecountyalerts.com a means to let us communicate with the public, but it lets them also, uh, enables them to tell us uh, if there's a special need that we can act on in a timely manner.
Thanks, Mo. That's super important. Okay, now we're going to switch a little to John Twitchell. Um, we now have a better sense of impacts at the regional level, and we know that conditions are only getting worse. We know how important forests are, and 2020 showed us how at risk they are. So, John, we want to talk with you to understand how forest conditions are changing and how fire behavior might evolve over the next 10 years. From the big picture you see, what are the current forest health conditions and how do those affect the values and benefits we get from them? Sure, um, a big question. Uh, forest health is not where we would like it. I think uh, most folks are familiar that um, uh, our forest conditions aren't, aren't where they could be and should be. Let me give you a little perspective though. Let me give you sort of four things to think about um, and then I'll get to how those values are affected. But from my point of view, and here in Northwest Colorado in particular, it's important to remember that um, our forests are relatively old. Uh, a lot of our lodgepole pine, uh, aspen forests, we haven't had a big landscape scale disturbance uh, since fires occurred in the late 1800s, uh, 100, 150 years ago, and during settlement time. When people were moving into this area and um, uh, and, and ranching and so forth started. So uh, that's important uh, disturbance and the last time it really occurred in, in any large numbers. Probably the biggest thing we all know the last 20 years, the climate's warmer and drier since 2000 at least. It's a longer term trend, but since 2000 we've, we've seen uh, uh, the longest historic drought we've had in Colorado was from 2001 to 2009. We're back in drought, have been since August of 2019. So uh, temperature and drought stress trees and dry out fuels and accelerate insect outbreaks and they promote large fire growth. So that's the second thing that we're kind of facing. Uh, fire suppression to some degree over the last hundred years has, has, has led to increased forest density uh, across the state really. We, we think of uh, when you get down on the front range, we think of the montane areas of the Ponderosa forest. I've really seen a lot of dug fir and croach. We don't have that problem quite as much here in, in uh, uh, Route County, but there are more trees than there were. And those trees normally would have been uh, uh, burned in periodic uh, mixed intensity fires. And so we have more fuel on the ground is what it comes down to. Finally, here in Northwest Colorado, uh, we definitely uh, we had the mountain pine beetle epidemic and that really changed things. And it's probably fading in people's uh, memories, but um, we're still very much living with it. There's a lot of dead trees out there as a result of the uh, mountain pine beetle epidemic. And now uh, the spruce bark beetle, which we had a spruce bark beetle epidemic here in uh, Route County, uh, 10 years ago or so, they're still around. They're an endemic, they're a natural species, but uh, that's affecting our forests as well. So all these stressors happening to our forests have, have kind of led to a condition that from a forester's point of view, and, and from most people's point of view, is less than ideal. So um, these, these are helping sort of fuel uh, these unprecedented fires. So how's that affect the benefits that we get from a forest, we get uh, you know, clean water. Sometimes they're called ecosystem services and probably the top of the list is water. Um, our forests capture, store, filter water for everybody. And we are uh, here in the mountains, we're an important source of water. Both these troublesome and the Cameron Peak fires uh, impacted critical water supplies for the front range of Colorado and for ourselves. Uh, also clean air, wildlife, aesthetics, recreation, and last but not least, in my mind, forest products. All of those are impacted by forest health and certainly by fire. And uh, so we're going to see those impacts here. Uh, we saw them last year where recreation was restricted and you know, with the pandemic, uh, there was some really extra pressure on the forest for recreation. And um, we now 
uh, get impacted. And, and uh, I think I saw a, a press release today from the US Forest Service on, on uh, recreating safely in these burned areas. So there's a lot of acres that, you, that we, we used to uh, play in, if you will, that we're going to have to uh, uh, be a little more careful. So finally, uh, the lumber prices, uh, we do, we're not a, we're not a bread basket for timber. We never have been, we never will be, but we produce forest products. Lumber prices, if you've been to the store lately, are at historic highs. Uh, two by four has never cost more. That might help us in the short term anyway, uh, deal with some of the backlog of uh, the dead trees, particularly the lodgepole pine, which unbelievably are still holding value after more than a decade of being dead. So that's a very quick snapshot of, of uh, where we're at today. It's not ideal, uh, but, uh, but we're working on it. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think we sometimes don't connect always the water, the forest health to water, which is a, a super critical one. And so thanks for bringing that up. So what do you see over the next 10 years? My crystal ball. Um, yeah, look at your crystal ball. <laughs> well, um, here's a great thing. And I, you know, during the mountain pine beetle epidemic, and I heard a lot of words like the forest is destroyed. And, and, and of course, it, it was an emotional experience for all of us uh, to see so many trees die. But forests, uh, they're recovering and they're growing back. And that's a great thing about trees. They do grow. And, and I think our forests are more resilient than sometimes we give them credit for. So we're still trying to understand the long-term impacts of, of uh, this warming climate. And if this current trend continues, uh, I think for the next 10 years, we're gonna continue to see some of the problems um, that we're, we're seeing now, uh, insects, disease, and wildfire. But we gotta remember, we live in a fire adapted ecosystem. Fire is not unnatural here and it's not unhealthy under the right conditions. The fires that we're seeing are sometimes called uncharacteristic in that there's a definite pattern of larger, frankly, more destructive fires that as far as we know, seems to break from the historic norm. And, and it's probably directly related to this, to this uh, drought and, and so forth. Um, but I'm a forester, my, my job and, and my profession is about looking into the future. And uh, I think, um, I think if, we, if we do some smart things now, uh, the forest is gonna be there for our children in the future. I really do. Well, that does lead me to my next question, which is how can we make a scalable concerted effort to improve forest and forest health? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. It's an important question. And it's one we've talked a little bit about today on the panel. And uh, it's one you're going to hear more and more about, you know, um, because it's about scale. How do we, how do we affect enough uh, acres? Um, you know, we heard Brad talk about some of the mitigation, but then we had a large area of timber burn up. So the way we're looking, it's important to do defensible space in the home ignition zone, you know, the homes uh, and the space, but as you uh, around your home, but as you move out into the forest, that's also important. And I think some of these fires really have brought that uh, home to everybody that uh, many times houses burn down without the fire actually reaching the home. It's a, it's a ember shower produced from the forest, which embers in these fires travel over a mile is not unusual. So what do we do? How do we do that at a scale that makes a difference? And, and we have to do it at a scale that makes a difference. So there's a couple of things I'll, I'll talk about where I think how I think we're going to get there. But one of the things I, I, I also want to say is it's scale, it's size, but it's also being strategic. You heard um, the pods, which fit very well into those, those, uh, those potentially uh, delineated uh, areas that are in lines basically in the landscape, uh, either physical or otherwise, that we can maybe uh, slow or stop a fire. So we have to be strategic, we have to be thoughtful, and um, we have to be at scale. Cameron Peak, 208,000, East Troublesome, 193,000, that's 400,000 just for those two fires 
it's a lot of area. Um, we don't treat nearly that much, but, but I'm not talking about treating the same amount that burns. We just have to be treat enough and we have to do it um, in the right places. So uh, I'm going to use the uh, well-worn metaphor of a three-legged stool. And uh, here's what my experience I, I think has told me. It, there's, there's, there's three important legs to the stool to get to this question of scale that you asked Sarah. One of them is we, we need an informed and engaged citizenry. And, uh, and people who are tuning into this on a beautiful day, uh, coming in to watch a Zoom call, I would say that's, that's pretty key. You, you folks uh, are, are helping inform and, and you're engaged by just listening to this and hopefully we spread that message because um, that's key. We need that social license to do things as well from you. We need a sustainable forest products industry. And this is key. Uh, we don't have much of a forest products industry, but both to sequester carbon and to, to utilize um, the, the wood that's coming off these uh, treatments, we need industry and we need to, we need to keep it um, what we have. And, and finally, we need the government support and the funding. And I think you see this conference where all those those things are at play. But anyway, those are my three things, informed, engaged citizenry, citizenry uh, a sustainable forest products industry that's, that's appropriate for our area. Uh, and we need the, the support, uh, the government support and funding, and each is a critical. Finally, Olivia, money given, the, the, the money for treatments is only part of the solution. I always liken that to, uh, a fish in the net, right? We talk about if you give somebody a fish, they eat, you know, they have a meal that night. If you give them a net, they can, they can provide for their food in the future. When we treat an acre of land, you got to remember, I'm a forester, it's going to grow back. So someone's going to have to treat that land again. And that's key to keep in mind. So we, we need to come up uh, with things that are maybe more sustainable than uh, we're currently uh, able to do. New technologies are promising, um, but they're not at scale yet. You hear biochar, biomass, all that stuff, but um, traditional forest products industry are here. And uh, a saying that I like is, it's easier to heal the sick than raise the dead. We, we have an industry. And finally, we need more capacity. We need um, more, frankly, trained resource professionals, uh, foresters, the people you see on this call, um, that is how we can most effectively use the dollars that we get from the various sources that we get. And we need to do that on a landscape scale, working with tools like the Good Neighbor Authority that we talked about, pods and concepts like shared stewardship. Awesome. Thank you, John. Great stuff. Now, Dan, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. We now, from John and others, we understand the value that forests bring to us and the urgency to address forest health and reduce wildfire risk. Now let's learn more about how the state is supporting these efforts. Then look into the future for us. We'll get that crystal ball back out. How seriously does Colorado need to take forest health and the risk of wildfire? Very, very seriously. But first of all, I wanna thank uh... Route County Wildfire Council, yourself, Sarah, for helping to, to moderate this. And I think this is what the couple year anniversary of the Wildfire Council. So congratulations for organizing that. I think it's extremely important um, that you have that in, in Route County. So it is very, 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 very important. Uh, I've personally worked at the federal, state and local level over my career. I'm a certified wildland firefighter. Last year, I was deployed to the Grizzly Creek Fire and the Cameron Peak Fire. And I have to say in all my years of working on kind of wildfire and forest health policy, I've never seen more urgency address the challenges that are in front of us than we have before us right now. And let me tell you why. Um, right now, climate change is, is the real deal. Um, Colorado is warmer and drier. Um, we, we have seen um, the US drought monitor um, has Colorado listed as, as extreme or exceptional drought for 32% of the state right now. Um, we're at 75% um, snowpack for, for Colorado 
in your neck of the woods in the Yampa River Basin, you're at about 78%. Uh, some of our average temperatures are actually warmer than the 1930s Dust Bowl, uh, which is just terrifying to, to say the least. Um, we know that wildfires are part of our, um, you know, of our ecosystem, but frankly, the, the future is, is very challenging to say the least. We have uh, overly dense forests, um, we have more human ignitions uh, than we've ever seen before, and, and on top of that, the changing climate, and then on top of that, we have about 60 to 70,000 people moving to the state a year. So we're about 5.9 million people in Colorado. And you've heard the term WUI, and I think we all know what that means now, the Wild and Urban Interface. But out of 5.9 million people, one in two Coloradans lives within the Wildland Urban Interface. Um, so that means <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. And thinking of a lot of work to do, um, John Twitchell and his colleagues at the Colorado State Forest Service did a really excellent job of the 2002 State Forest Action Plan that really listed, listed and determined that there was about $700 million that's needed to perform wildfire mitigation work in the most high priority areas. And, and so this is not just you know, the, the random acts of restoration of, of thinning projects here and there. These are targeted areas that we really need. And then on top of that, um, since 2005, um, about 3,000 homes and structures have been lost. So, you know, Chief Brad White will tell you, you know, there's a lot of structures that were lost in, in Grand County with East Troublesome Fire. Um, I've personally been on um, evacuation notices uh, in Summit County. Uh, it is scary. So um, going back to your initial question, how seriously is Colorado taking this, this issue? Um, it is one of my highest priorities as the, as the head of Department of Natural Resources, where I have oversight of everything of uh, everything, land, water, wildlife, minerals, and oil and gas. Those are all hot button topics but forest health and planning and working with local communities, working with our federal partners is more important than ever before. That's, that's good to hear that it's a, a top priority for sure for you. So what is the state of Colorado doing to address the emerging challenges we see in front of us? Well, there's, there's a saying that um, you never let a catastrophe go wasted. Yeah. And, and we really um, do have almost a silver lining right now on a variety of fronts. Um, this year has been a very, very busy legislative session. And there are quite a few different bills that, you know, it's 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 been a, amazing, you know, bipartisan. This, this is actually forest health and planning for wildfires is the one topic I'd say nationally, and I hope locally in your community too, but definitely at the state level, it is totally nonpartisan. Uh, people are working collaboratively to figure out how you can bring the best resources to communities. Um, my boss, the governor, has been working really hard on this, and I just want to share with you some of the highlights that we've seen so far, and I want to give you a little teaser of some stuff, too, we're working on in the future, but already, um, this just this past March, the governor signed Senate Bill 21-54, which transferred $6 million into the Forest Restoration and Wildfire Mitigation Grant Program, otherwise known as FURWORM. That program's administered through uh, the State Forest Service, um, and I know John Twitchell can, can speak at length at that, but this, this grant round is uh, open now for collaboratives, for local governments, for homeowners associations um, can, can apply for this funding right now. Um, the bill also provided $4 million for the watershed restoration projects, and that's administered through the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, I know we're really focused kind of on the on the front end on the mitigation side, but I have to stress, and I know Mo knows this very well on um, looking at larger scale emergencies, but after fires and incidents, you know, the, the water the water quality and quantity issues are real. Uh, the threat of, of flooding is real. And we're seeing price tags just from last year of millions and millions and millions of dollars that are needed. And um, and so I, I feel good about you know the amount of money we have going forward with this. There's going to be some more um, as well. So that was part of this uh, initial package that was part of a um, um, within this current fiscal year money. But then moving forward for the next fiscal year, 
We're looking at $8 million annually for that fur worm program that, that again is administered through the State Forest Service. And then 2 million per year to support core programs at the Colorado State Forest Service, including those programs that support uh, community wildfire protection plans. I know, uh, I think you all were talking about updating those CWPP plans. It's really important. Um, but, but it comes with a price tag too. Um, it's, it, it takes time and effort to do that. We are also working right now to support um, uh, further packages on a Colorado recovery plan that's part of a stimulus package that um, is, is all encompassing that would include more money um, for the State Forest Service, more money um, that would be directed towards the Department of Natural Resources, um, more money to look at capacity. We're working with our corrections crews in Colorado, really trying to beef up uh, the, the ability of, of those teams. We are also working with youth corps around the state of Colorado, trying to um, help support them. Um, and then also moving forward on the, the watershed component, uh, we have $15 million moving forward uh, to support the, the watershed projects for next year too. Um, so I think those are all, you know, really positive things. Um, when, when you look at all those together, we're nearly doubling the budget for State Forest Service for some of these programs. And, and they need, um, you know, consistent funding. You can't go from a $1 million grant program to 8 million overnight. We're actually doing that and it's going to be challenging, <laughs> um, but we need consistent funding so we can ramp up the efforts that um, state foresters have locally, the ramp up efforts that people in the timber industry have. And um, so I'm, I feel very optimistic about um, what the future will hold um, in terms of how we're working with all of our partners. And then thinking of Keith Thompson and his role with US Forest Service, um, we also have a, a shared stewardship uh, MOU that's signed by the state of Colorado and US Department of Ag that really spells out how we collaborate in the future to really look at you know, those pods that were discussed earlier, looking at the right locations and not just kind of these random locations that really don't mean a lot. You know, when you look at, um, I'd be curious to get Chief, Chief White's thoughts, but when you look at the East Troublesome Fire, and how that grew over 100,000 acres, literally like less than overnight, not every acre is treated equally. You know, the acres that are close to your house, the acres that, um, you know, whether or not you can save your house or not, those are the most meaningful for people. And I would say those acres that are critical to support our watersheds are also critically important. So let's focus on those right areas. Thank you, Dan. That's great. It's great to hear. I know you also have been a county commissioner. And so just from that experience and how can a county like ours, rural, public land dominated and from the Western Slope work with the state government to make progress towards becoming more fire adapted? Yeah, good question, Sarah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a recovering um, county commissioner and uh, you have you have great county commissioners in Route County. I, I really enjoy working with them and, and they, they do take these issues very, very seriously. Um, before I was a county commissioner and I was a, a state legislator, my side job was working as Summit County's wildfire mitigation specialist. So worked as a county commissioner and working on the ground, uh, helping to get projects off the ground was, was, was important. But you know, th there are a lot of things that you can do. I think I, I'm not aware of all the different things you're doing, but the first step I think is forming this wildfire council. So that is extremely important when you have diverse group of stakeholders that can come together, that really you can take a hard look at your community wildfire protection plan. And we know that there are scarce resources, but use that CWPP as a tool to focus in on those areas that you most need to protect. You know, is it, is it that community center? Is that that neighborhood? Is that the reservoir? Is it um, critical infrastructure? Like focus in on those areas that are the highest value for your community. So I think that's really important. Also, you know, I, I would encourage Route County and Steamboat and, and the, the other, you know, towns within uh, Route County to take a hard look at 
um, whether or not you'd want to contemplate um, looking at a sales tax or a property tax to leverage more resources to help fund projects. Um, Forest Service, US Forest Service only has a certain amount of resources. The state only has a certain amount of resources, but when, when you can combine local funds, federal funds, state funds, sometimes water providers are pitching in. You know, you have the, uh, the Forest to Faucets program that Denver Water has put millions of dollars in. Um, that's amazing. And so, um, so Chafee County, Summit County, they have uh, different local property taxes and sales tax. Vail has a sales tax to go towards their mitigation crew. So that's something you, you may want to consider. Also, there's a bill moving forward in the legislative session right now that would give it to make it easier to form a special district. So similar to you know school district or um, I know you're familiar with special districts. So you know a fire district, for example, a local community can 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 look at a boundary and say, okay, you know around the steamboat area. Um, let's let's form a special district and those property taxes would help go towards you know mitigation efforts. Um, so you can explore those. Also, um, I would encourage everyone to take a hard look. Um, and this is really probably more for the county commissioners, but look at your um, uh, community wildfire protection plan that you have in place. Look at your land use plans, look at your zoning requirements, looking at your building codes. And, and mesh all those together and see where the conflicts are. I can guarantee you there'll be huge conflicts. We did that in Summit County and our community wildfire protection plan had very strict language on uh, defensible space, on, on promoting zones one, two, and three to make sure that you know within zones one, which is just so everyone knows, zone one is between like zero feet from your house, like from your house out about 15 to 30 feet. Um, that, that you have not necessarily a clear cut, but, but you wanna make sure the vegetation is in check. But then our building code said, you know, within that zone areas that you had to plant pine trees, <laughs> that you had to plant, you know, certain vegetations that were like flew in the face was not consistent with our community wildfire protection plan, like totally opposite. And those two documents, you know, building codes and our community wildfire fire protection plan are two very important, you know, documents and, and so we totally revamped everything to make sure that those, all those documents were consistent. And, and I thought that was really important. It, 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 it was a process that it didn't take, you know, it, it didn't take five years or anything, but it, it definitely took a little bit of time to do. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's it for me. I need to look at my notes, but, but yeah, it's really critical too, to get that buy-in, your, 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 your local, um, collaborative that you hear, I have here, the fire council can be a leading voice for that social buy-in that John Twitchell mentioned. If your local community does not support a particular forest thinning project in your neighborhood, guess what? It's not going to happen probably, you know, you need that social buy-in. And I really encourage Rock County to really come together to make this a priority. Fire season is real. Fires are going to happen. Fires are scary as hell. And your community needs to come together to look at those priority areas and the state, local government, feds will all come together to work to help you out along the way. Thank you, Dan. That's great information and great suggestions for on the county level. Um, some of those are great. And I know I was watching Julie because as you're talking about planning and codes, she was smiling away because Julie who's speaking next is a senior planner with the city and, and is actually working on the committee to evaluate different plans to make sure that we are being consistent. So it was perfect. So thanks, Dan. And now I will turn it over to Julie. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess, Sarah, you probably want to read me a question first, right? Um, I do. Um, so just, you know, quickly, we are so grateful to our, our initial panelists who have brought context to this conference and really delved into the work being done at the regional and state level to improve forest health and reduce wildfire risk. But we are turning to you, Julie, to help us kind of bring it back, bring it home. Um, you know, can tell us a little bit more about the Wild, uh, Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council, what we're doing, um, and kind of tee us up for the next, um, next webinars. So 
Can you tell us a little bit about the formation and the current work of the council? Yeah, Dan gave a great lead in. So mm -hmm. I became involved with the Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council about a year and a half ago. Um, in my current role at the city of Steamboat Springs, I don't, I don't do a lot of work in wildfire mitigation planning. However, I have in the past worked with many communities um, with while I was at FEMA and as a consultant. And so it's, it's really important to me to be able to help our communities here in Route County to strengthen our mitigation plans and programs and our assistance to property owners. Um, so a little background on, on the council, it, it started as a grassroots group of local stakeholders a few years ago um, that formed a steering committee to plan the 2019 Route County Wildfire Conference. And one of the major outcomes of that conference um, was a recommendation um, to form a formal wildfire council to help coordinate uh, mitigation activities in the county. And so that same steering committee, um, along with uh, some other additional fo folks, worked to establish the Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council as a 501 uh, C3 nonprofit organization. Um, and they formed a, a governing board and governance structure and bylaws. And then this last year, the board uh, dedicated time to strategic planning. And so really seeking to articulate our organization's mission. So our purpose, what we're here to achieve, how we're gonna achieve it. And, um, and so we've developed a Michigan mission statement for the council and that is to create more resilient fire adapted communities to minimize the impacts of wildfire. And we do this through partnerships and coordination, education and outreach and programs that assist with long-term risk reduction. And so you'll specifically notice the word mitigation in the title of our council. So mitigation is long-term risk reduction. And so our focus is not response to wildfire, but our focus is proactive, long-term sustainable risk reduction. Um, and so the, the council, we, we see that, you know, we'd like to work with partnerships and collaboration and information sharing um, around four main areas that we're focused on for mitigation. Uh, the first is public education and outreach about wildfire risk and actions um, that we all can take to reduce risk. Second is supporting property owners through technical assistance to take action on their own properties. Third is coordinating countywide information and resources to help prioritize larger scale forest management and fuel reduction projects. So projects that would protect infrastructure and watersheds and you know, larger scale neighborhood versus individual properties. And then fourth, encouraging and strengthening local planning, um, including land use planning and development and building codes to incorporate wildfire mitigation principles. Um, so obviously this last one is uh, near and dear to my own heart and something that um, at the city and the planning departments for Steamboat Springs we recognize as an area where we have, we have some work to do. And so the council has, we've identified 10 objectives uh, for the next three years. Um, you can find those on our website. And I just wanted to kind of highlight a few of those for you. So these are the things that, you know, between now and 2023, we hope to have accomplished or have a good start on. Um, one of those is putting on this, this conference and making it an annual event. Um, updating the community wildfire protection plan, um, as, you, as you've heard mentioned a few times with previous speakers. Um, we also have an objective to assist an interested community or neighborhood to achieve firewise communities designation. Um, and also looking at how we can establish a community assessment program that would help property owners to identify hazardous fuels and appropriate mitigation measures on their properties. So we need all of your help in achieving these objectives and our, and our mission to make Route County more resilient and fire adapted. Um, you could learn about the council at our, we have a new website called routewildfire.org. Um, and so you can reach out through their website or to any board member if you'd like to learn more about how to become involved with the council. Uh, if you wanna to talk to someone about ideas for project activities or funding sources. If you are a funding source, we'd really love to hear from you. So please reach out. And overall, this conference, the council and this conference, you know, it's all about that we all have a role in reducing risk to wildfire uh, from individual homeowners to neighborhood organizations to all levels of government. And so the three follow up sessions over the next three weeks are opportunities for us to examine how we all can work together at those different scales to make our communities safer during future wildfires. 
Um, so on behalf of the Wildfire Mitigation Council, we look forward to learning and collaborating with all of you during this year's conference. Thank you, Julie, so much. That was a perfect, perfect wrap up. Um, so now we're going to turn it over. I know I've been seeing some good questions coming in. So we're going to turn it over to Carolina Manriquez, who is a forester with the State Forest Service, and she's going to be helping with the moderate the Q&A. Hello, everyone. Wonderful conversation. So much information, so much to digest. And um, I'm just going to uh, read out some of the questions from our audience. Um, the first one is from Kathy Lorini, and she is just wondering if these mitigation efforts are limited to public lands. Who from our panel would like to take a 30 second shot at this? Brad, you are muted. Yeah, yeah I, uh, you know, I, uh... I guess my message would be no, you know, you the, the closer to home the work is, the more effective it's going to be for your home. And, uh, you know, what we saw in these troublesome is this huge fire front that went through. And, and in some subdivisions, it was, you know, not just minutes or hours, but many hours, 10, 20 hours before we actually could put firefighters into certain parts of the certain subdivisions. And, you know, the more, more prepared your property and your home is to stand alone for a few hours, the, the better success you're going to have on, you know, on your own property. That's right. Uh, okay, Lena, let, me just, let me quickly add to that, though. What the nice thing is with some of these tools and with our partners on this, uh, like Kevin Thompson in the Forest Service, we're working cross boundary. So we're working. That's the beauty of it. We're working on both the private and wherever we can do that. That's the sweet spot, wherever we can connect. Uh, the fire doesn't stop at your property line, unfortunately. So um, by connecting those two actions, um, it uh, strengthens that, that uh, activity around the home. And that's uh, along the lines of the next question. We have um, a private landowner wondering how can, who can they work with when they have 40 acres adjacent to the national forest? How can they go about thinking across boundaries so who should they talk to well again i, I not to um I, I call a colorado state forest service uh for private land management and um it's it's uh sometimes it's it's it, we things fall into place that the important thing is on on federal land there has to be uh nepa done sometimes nepa exists and that's that's ideal because then things can happen fairly quickly, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, the good neighbor authority, you've heard that mentioned a few times today, uh, I hope, um, that allows the State Forest Service to work on federal land. That gives us authority to do that. We didn't have that before, uh, oh, you know, years ago. Now that authority is permanent. So we can work with people like Kevin. It has to be a mutual uh, a thing, but again, that's where the best, that's the sweet spot. It's working on that federal and private ground. And we, the more we can do that, the more that we can slow those wildfires down that are, that are headed towards homes and, and other values at risk. Sounds good. Yeah, Carolina, I would also just add that the council is a resource for people to, to get answers to those types of questions as well. Exactly. There's an I connect with them info at wildfire.org and we can get some of your questions answered. Um, what do panelists see as the biggest factor to get through the fire season this year? Do we need to get more people signed up to reverse 9-11, reverse more, more land fuel treatment, education? What, what's what's going to be the critical factor? Can I just say yes to all of that? No, um, to be, to look at that, I, I think it all starts, one, it starts with education. Like that's the biggest. And part of that education factor is that reverse 911 or route county alerts, which Mo, Mo got to. It's getting people involved and people thinking about it. That's the very first step. And then as we go through, you know, then that leads to the, the fuels treatments. And like John was talking before, they need to be across boundaries. We can't stop at fence lines anymore like we have in the past. We've, we've got to work together and make sure that we're, we're going on both sides and that we're getting as much 
much bang for the buck as we can in these areas that we're doing stuff. And Carolyn, I have a, I have a couple comments. So as much as I'm trying to push registration route county alerts, the reality is route county alerts is not going to mitigate property. So um, while I think it's extremely important because that's how I that's how I can best keep the public safe or at least uh, tell them what they need to do to be safe. It's not going to mitigate property. Uh, but the second point I'd like to make is that since her question is really referencing this year and not long term, um, you know, a lot of these larger fuel reduction models that we're looking at, you know, more long term, uh, I think it's that individual um, homeowner going to the uh, Firewise website and seeing what they can do on their individual property would be, um, I think, the best success we can have this year. And I would also add that for sure. And then also there's many, many of us who are, are in communities, small communities or HOAs and go to your HOA board and identify this as an, it's important. Um, and, you know, that's work that can be done in the short term in a season, even if it's just, you know, trying to support um, multiple homeowners doing work on their property. And also in many cases, the common, the common land within the HOA. And that's, that's um, a step in the right direction, at least, um, that can be done in the short term. It's action you can take now. It's something that is feasible now. Um, now, we have uh, an interesting question here about pods, Kevin. Uh, does the pods framework involve strategic prescribed burning to protect strategic resources? or particularly vulnerable landscape features like high-risk recreation areas, primitive camping areas, et cetera? So yeah, um, what we're seeing with the pods is in some places they've gone down and gone this, gone or pr pretty small with their pods. Um, other places they've gone pretty large. Um, it's pretty much what you want it to be if, but there's a side of reality to it too, of where, you know, when John was talking about where are we strategically right now in our forests and what can we really afford to do? Do we gotta look, do we look at those individual campgrounds or do we look at a large scale area? And so I, I think right now where we're at, we're looking more with our pods of large scale, hoping in the, in the future that we can start to make those more and more and get them into smaller and get a lot of those areas. Your, your water, your watersheds and stuff like that, absolutely, those are definitely a key in there. Campgrounds, I don't think we're that, we identify them and have those areas as a, a value or in there, but I, it's not probably right now where we're, we're uh, focusing in on. With, with ours. In the future, will we get there? I sure hope so. Yeah, and I, I would just maybe add, um, you know, what I think of the pods and we're, we're working, I'm working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on doing a whole statewide assessment and using the pods as, as a vehicle to do that. And it's really big picture, you know, Kevin, I think it's it kind of just adding on to what you said. It's I think historically, you know, sometimes there's been the, the same, you know, random acts of restoration, you know, like sometimes there's different quotas in different forests to, to produce a certain amount of board feet and, and, but going back to like my, my reference to Chief White on like, when you look at the East Troublesome Fire, not every acre is equal, like making sure that you're really focusing in on those key locations and those key locations could be where the Forest Service comes right up to, you know, a neighborhood. Um, and that HOA wants to be proactive in their work, but yeah, they need to do some cross boundary work. Um, and that should be a big priority. It could be uh, critical, you know, um, watershed areas. It could be, um, um, you know, building into where there's already work that's been done where you can create a longer fire break for a community. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, moving into a very strategic uh, way of thinking about what areas are you use appropriate management response where you let areas burn where they should burn historically and what areas you, you got to use suppression to put that fire out really, really quickly. Um, 
the idea of, of a council in, um, in, in kind of the process that we've gone through in the last few years is, is of interest around the state on how to replicate this effort. And so there's a question that came in that although the route council is recently formed, are we already seeing interest and buy-in from the general public? Has the council been able to get the word out about what we do? And are we seeing interest in this cooperation effort? Julie? Yeah, well, we, we, we're working on it. And I think this, the interest in this conference and the, the number of participants is a, is a great sign. Um, one, of our, one of our objectives for this year is to complete a community engagement and education plan that really spells out better ways that we can get, get outreach out there and let the public know about the different resources that we provide and um, you know the different committees that we have formed to, to try to work on those, those different goals and program areas that, that I um, described. So I, you know, I, I, I feel like we have a lot of great momentum right now. We do, we do. And part of that mitigation work has to be done through um, a sustainable forest products industry, right? We need, we need to have that capacity from our local contractors to help us with that work. And so a question came in uh, about how, is, how could we support a sustainable forest products in industry here locally and how might it help us realize our forest-based climate goals, carbon sequestration, watershed health, etc. John, do you, do you want to say a few things about that? You're muted. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Uh, apologize. I'm the invasive mute button. Um, uh, yeah, sustainable forest industry. We have some small businesses around here uh, capable, some pretty exciting stuff uh, um, uh, that, that can utilize our local products. Uh, they, they barely can get enough wood to stay uh, going. So, so sustainable wood uh, business in, in, in my mind means that um, we need to give them a little more support than we have, I think. Um, and I think some of the, uh, the some of the grants and some of the money that uh, some of the programs that Dan was talking about earlier, in fact, have some low uh, interest loans. One of the hard things about being in the wood products industry is, um, that, you know, it's it's harder to get money because uh, uh, to borrow money to to be in that business. But I think there's a, a size, a, an appropriate size for us in this area, and um, so giving them technical support providing uh, grants and loans, and, and most importantly, maybe having the mindset that we can have a healthy, sustainable forest with a supply of material. Dan mentioned about scaling you know, with grant money, going from a million to eight million and how difficult that is. Well, that same principle applies with people in the forest products industry. You can't run, you can't borrow money if you can't get wood. So. There's a lot to that question, but those are a couple of the things. Uh, having a sustainable supply, which means that committed citizenry, citizenry that's uh, going to accept some log trucks and making sure we don't zone out uh, forest products industry, which, which has happened in, in some places of the state. Thank you. Um, we're going to do one last question. I think um, we are almost at 630. So, um, there's a question here that if, if, can anyone please speak to the Colorado income tax deduction for mitigation and how homeowners can use it? Hey, Dan? Yeah, that was actually my, my, my bill a long time ago and it offered a, uh, then it was a $2,500 income tax reduction for uh, expenses that homeowners occurred um, to do mitigation around their house. So it, 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 the idea was that, as some of us mentioned, like, what can you do now? Well, you can look at your own property <laughs> and really take a hard look at, you know, removing dead trees and, and any flammable um, biomass material around your house. And um, it, there's a sunset, but I think, I think that bill was reauthorized this year. 
So I, I believe that still exists. So I think Julie and probably the fire council could, could probably help you um, navigate that or, or I can too. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you to the public for all these wonderful questions. And now back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Carolina, for moderating the Q&A. And thank you to all of our panelists for this great discussion. And it was such a great way to kick off this conference. Um, we want to, of course, thank the Steamboat Springs Board of Realtors for their support of this conference. Um, I also want to mention, I know we didn't get to all of the questions, so um, we will look into those. I would suggest if you have a burning question, info at routewildfire.org um, and we will follow up with you on that. Um, also, the webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website as soon as we get it loaded to YouTube. Um, so you can find that link on our website. I also, Julie had mentioned that, you know, really, we really want to do more engagement and education and outreach. Um, so you will see at the end of this um, webinar, a survey will pop up asking you what else you want to know. What other information do you want to know to help you with wildfire mitigation, whether it's in a webinar format or um, brochures, information. Um, we'll be using that to guide our education and outreach in the upcoming year. So with that, thank you all attendees. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists and have a good night, everyone.